Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Tammy Warrender. I am the lead coordinator of the Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Response Project. I have been working on this project since June 2020 when the disease first appeared on our reefs in the Cayman Islands. Um, and we've been working tirelessly nonstop on this project um, since, since we found it on our reefs in Grand Cayman. Uh, with me today is Katie Banks. She's going to be helping me to moderate uh, the, the talk today. And we also have Dr. Croy McCoy on the line. Um, so he'll be here to help with any questions and be part of the discussion at the end. He's been a researcher at the department for, for a long time now. So he knows our reefs incredibly well. Um, so yeah, uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. This, um, the, objectives of, the objectives of this presentation are to go through the history of the disease, uh, the identification of the disease, other corals and other threats, what might be confused with stony coral tissue loss disease to try and identify um, between those uh, other coral diseases and threats. This is something we will go more into detail in later presentations as well. The, the particular response that the Department of Environment's been doing and how it's progressed around the islands and how you can help us too. So first of all, the history of stony coral tissue loss disease. In 2018, um, stony coral tissue loss disease had started to spread around the Caribbean. It originated in Florida in 2014. So it took around about four years um, for the disease to start jumping around to different regions, or at least other countries became aware of the disease on their reefs at that time. It then continued to spread uh, to other areas, such as the Bahamas, the Belize, St. Eustatius, Dominican Republic. It continued to jump around um, the Caribbean in 2019. Later in 2020, we started seeing it in the Cayman Islands and it progressed further southward to St. Lucia. And now in 2021, you can see there's 20 countries that have the disease. Um, there may be more. This is just the countries that are reporting about the disease. And um, it's as far south as St. Lucia on the on the, west, on the eastern side of the Caribbean and as far down south as St. Lucia on the, on the Western Caribbean. Uh, there's lots of other countries that are working on this disease. Um, there's 11 countries that are doing similar treatments like, to, like what we are doing in the Cayman Islands. And there's over 19 countries that are monitoring for spill D. So that includes countries further south and further north in Bermuda as well, who are waiting to see whether the, the disease has a, a latitudinal extent or whether it will appear on their reefs too. So what is known about this disease? How is it transmitting and what is the pathogen? Researchers have been unable to determine the pathogen, um, but evidence does suggest that it's a bacterial infection. This is because we've had some success with antibiotic treatment. Um, but there has also been new fi findings that suggest that it's a viral pathogen. This viral pathogen um, is thought to interrupt the symbiotic relationship between the zooxanthellae and the corals. So the coral has this partnership with a tiny little sin single-celled algae and um, the single-celled algae, the zooxanthellae, provides as much as 80% of the energy to the coral through photosynthesis. So when their partnership is disrupted, the coral is very stressed in that situation. So it is thought that this viral, this virus actually affects the symbiotic algae, um, and then the, it kills that algae, which then like disrupts the coral's um, coral's health and the tissue starts to slough off the, the skeleton. So there's, it might have yet an association between both why we're having um, successful results with antibiotic treatments. This is either a, an initial a bacterial infection or a secondary bacterial infection with this viral infection. 
Uh, evidence suggests that there's multiple, multiple modes of transmission, uh, which include direct touch. So if a coral is touching another coral, water circulation, if two corals aren't touching each other, it still manages to jump from one coral to the next through the water column. Dive gear is a possible source of transmission. If you dive in an infected site and then move to an uninfected site, you can spread the, they believe that you can spread the disease in that way. In the same way with boat bilges and ballast water. If you suck in water from a diseased infected site, if it's in the water column, then uh, you can put out that water on a site that's not infected and spread it in that way. There's a lot of evidence for these modes of transmission now. Um, but there's still a lot of studies and a lot of time that's going into trying to find out exactly how it is transmitted from area to area. Once it's established on a reef, it seems like the, the pathogen spreads linearly. So when it turned up on our reef, it moved from a focal point on the reef and then spread it along the reef in a linear fashion instead of jumping around sporadically in the beginning. I only started to do that later in the game in Grand Cayman. Uh, when it establishes on a coral, it has both focal and multifocal areas. So it either spreads in one single line on the coral or it has multiple areas of infection, which gives a spotty white appearance, which we'll see soon. Overall impacts, once established, the disease spreads rapidly and is known to affect over 20 species of hard coral. In places like Turks and Caicos, they've actually recorded it on 30 plus species of coral. Once a coral is infected by stony coral tissue loss disease and begins to lose its live tissue, it is likely that the colony will die within weeks to months. So it's an incredibly fast paced disease, unlike our other diseases which take a long time to kill the coral, like over years sometimes. The coral the loss of coral density and species diversity affects the overall coral reef health and can have catastrophic impacts to the ecosystem services that they provide. Corals are important for our tourism industry and for, for storm protection, for um, providing shelter to thousands of animals. Um, they're very important and they protect our Cayman Islands. Stony coral tissue loss disease identification. So as I mentioned, the appearance of this disease is focal or multifocal lesions and that radiate outwards, slowly um, overcoming the whole coral colony. This is an example of a tagged coral on the north side of Grand Cayman that we followed through time. Uh, we tagged it in July. And this was in a site that had stony coral tissue loss disease on the site, um, but it didn't get infected until September. So even though the disease was on this site for, for over three months, it wasn't until September it got infected and then we monitored it every week to see the progression. So it only took three weeks, two weeks for this coral to, to die completely. So the progression is very rapid. It can it can kill a whole colony in two weeks and it can progress to up to four centimeters per day. Here are some other species on the north side of Grand Cayman. I won't go into too much detail about this. We will have uh, another um, presentation specifically on coral identification. But, uh, these are some of the species of this coral, this um, stony coral tissue loss disease infects. So the ones on the top there, the smooth flower coral, maize coral, and elliptical star coral, they are the highly susceptible species. So the way that this disease moves is it initially affects these corals, and then it moves on to other high susceptible species, but ones that are not the first um, ones to be infected on a reef. So you'll typically see the three on the top infected, and then you'll start to see the brain corals, like the symmetrical brain coral, the boulder brain coral, the massive starlet coral. They're the, the ones that will get infected soon after. You start to see it on the spread on the highly susceptible species. And then you have your lettuce coral, boulder star coral, groove brain coral, massive starlet coral. Uh, they succumb a little later. The, 
the one on the bottom row there, the massive starlet coral, Sideroshria steria. It has a little bit of a different appearance. Instead of uh, a large white uh, lesion, they actually start to fluoresce first. I'm not sure if you've seen this coral fluorescing on the reef, but um, when it bleaches, it grows a bright pink or a bright blue color. And so when, when this is coral is stressed, it does that first, but then when it's infected with stony coral tissue loss disease, it begins to form these dark pigmented areas, which over time become white and start to progress into lesions. So the disease manifests a little bit differently in this species. So it's something to watch out for. But it's, it's often a very easy indicator. Like, like I, I wouldn't confuse the Sidastria sidaria on the bottom left side with, with any other kind of disease. It's very distinctive. Um, yeah, so we also have this other very highly susceptible species called pillar coral. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this one, but it's quite rare and endangered on our reefs already. And it's also very highly susceptible to this disease. So these pictures were taken at a colony at Rum Point um, that's unfortunately dead now. We didn't have any treatments at the time that this coral got infected in August 2020. Um, but these photos were taken weeks apart. So it's just to highlight the, the speed of the progression of the disease in just a week's time on this species in particular. It's very multifocal. So you can see all the different lesions that's popped up in different areas in this coral. If you look at the 11th of August picture on the right there, that dark um, yellowish colored area is older death. Then you have the white area, which is nearer death. And then the brown fuzzy looking stuff is the healthy tissue. So if you compare that with the photo next to it, you'll see it was much smaller the week before and it's just slowly progressing and they all meet up with each other and you're just left with a bare skeleton. There is some hope. There's, there's some corals that do not seem to be affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. You have your mustard hill coral, your finger corals, um, your cervicornis and your palmata, the staghorn and elkhorn coral. They're not thought to be affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, we are noticing some parietes asteroides, the mustard hill coral on the top left there. It has been seen to have some kind of disease on our reef recently. Uh, we believe that it is linked to stony coral tissue loss disease, but we don't have enough evidence um, so far to say for sure that it's the same disease. Um, but yeah, only time will tell whether these species do succumb to, to a disease similar to this or the same disease. Other coral diseases and other threats. So here are some common hard coral diseases. We have black band disease, dark spot disease, white band disease, red band disease, yellow band disease, and white plague disease. You'll be interested to know, I'm sure, that they're all named after their appearance. Um, typically corals are just, um, they're named for their morphology because in the beginning when they first, when we first find the diseases, we don't know what's causing them. And there's still a lot of unknowns in the disease, the coral disease world. So the black band disease has been named for the typical black band. Yellow band has a typical yellow band. Dark spot disease has dark spots. You can, you can see a theme. White band disease is only found on the acroporids, the branching corals. Uh, the one on the bottom right, is called white plague disease. And it's the one that can be confused most with stony coral tissue loss disease because it's another type of white disease. And sometimes these white diseases get grouped together when they can't find a, a, a pathogen for them. Um, but white plague disease does tend to move slower, at least this, this species. There's type one and type two. so different known white plague diseases have spread faster than others, um, but none has been 
as persistent as stony coral tissue loss disease. They're the first study to ever be done on this disease, um, a famous coral disease biologist and um, ecologist said it was a type of white plague disease because the appearance was so similar and um, it's almost impossible to differentiate between white plague disease and stony coral tissue disease apart from when you monitor how long it takes for a coral to die and the, the sloughing of the tissue is another it's another aspect So here is an example of pillar coral, both with white plague disease and with stony coral tissue loss disease. So the white plague disease is, um, like I said, slower. Uh, we've been watching killer pillar on the west side of Grand Cayman for more than two years now, and it's slowly creeping up from the base of the colonies to the tips over years of time, whereas the colony at Rum Point Channel probably took less than a month and a half to completely succumb to stony coral tissue loss disease. So it's, it's very rapid in comparison, but it can look quite similar. But if you have it side by side in a picture like these, you can see a lot of differences with the multifocal nature of stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, it's it appears anywhere on the colony. It doesn't just appear from the base, which white plague seems to do. Um, this is just one species example. The white plague and stony coral tissue loss disease affects many species, so it's quite similar. You have to sort of track the progression on the coral to differentiate between the two if you're monitoring brain corals or, or other species. Um, stony coral tissue loss disease versus coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is also at a, when the, when the um, little zooxanthellae is lost from the coral. So when the temperatures become stressful for the coral, the zooxanthellae will be um, released or kicked out of the coral and the coral will start to turn white. So and this time the coral is losing out of this vital nutritional component of its lifestyle, um, but it does not in any ways mean that the coral is dead. It later depends um, how long the, te the temperatures have changed, how long they can withstand this um, reduced mal malnourishment. So um, you can see the difference in these bottom photos here when a coral is completely dead you can see that there's algae and turf algae that starts to grow on the, the coral skeleton. You can see straight through to the little teeth of the, of the septa um, in comparison to the photo on the right, which is a bleached coral. And if you look very closely at that picture, just like the top picture, which is a healthy, um, di a healthy um, coral, you can see the little tentacles that are out and protruding and wiggling around. So if you're in the field, if you can see these tentacles or see the layer of tissue on top of the coral, then you know it's still alive and it's not dead. It hasn't been completely um, killed by, by a disease. Here are some other pictures on that top left photo there. You can see again, the tentacles are expanding around the polyps and they're feeding. So this coral isn't dead. Uh, you also have the bottom left photo where you can see a blend of, um, of color. So this is a good way to try and differentiate between coral bleaching and the disease. You wouldn't see so much of a blend in a disease colony. Um, sometimes next to the lesion, you'll see a slightly um, reduced color vibrancy on the area immediately next to the lesion because it's still stressed. Um, but when you see this change, this shading change, in this photo here with the brain coral, the left side of it has more of the zooxanthellae in the tissues than the area on the right hand side does, which is why it seems to be paler. So we would say that this coral is paling and that's the early stages of coral bleaching. Um, on the right hand side is full on bleaching. These are bleached corals. They don't have 
nannies or xanthelli in the tissues at all. Um, so they appear white. If you were to look closely, you would still be able to see the tentacles. Uh, you would still see that there's um, some tissue covering the polyps. It's not dead like our initial picture here where algae starts to grow on top of it. Um, you can definitely see right into the ridges and the grooves. Um, it's very, it's completely like um, calcium carbonate. You can see the calcium carbonate skeleton that, that the coral produces. Here's another example of a coral infected with stony coral tissue list disease. You can see exactly where the disease started on the coral and exactly where the disease ended on the coral. So if you look in the middle of the coral, you can see living tissue still. That purpley brown area is live tissue that will eventually in the next day be sloughed off by the coral. It will just um, peel off the coral. Um, the area surrounding that is new death and it's white. So that's recent death between one to five days or so, maybe less, one to three days. And then the older death, it starts to look like this after a week. Um, the new death has uh, like turf algae growing on it. So it starts to look a little bit hairy, whereas the older death is very hairy and it has macroalgae growing on top of it, all the forked algae there called dictyola and things start to grow in it very rapidly and it just becomes part of the part of the reef. But unfortunately it's one less coral and more algae because they're very good at colonizing dead areas of coral. So stony coral tissue loss disease in the Cayman Islands. It arrived in Grand Cayman in June 2020 at a dive site called Penny's Arch, just um, outside of Run Point Channel on the north coast of Grand Cayman. From this area, it started to progress both east and west. When it arrived, one of the first things that we decided to do was to do boat tow surveys. So we hang a line off the back of the boat, put on our snorkeling gear, hold onto the line and get dragged around by the boat. Because of the nature of how this disease looks and the way that it progresses, it's quite easy to identify the disease from the surface because it appears as these bright white lesions and it really stands out um, between the blue background and the other colors. So when we get towed, we hold on and we put our hand up when we see something and then we have the boat come around and take a coordinate and that's the way that we can make these nice maps that I'm sure you've all seen on social media of the progression. So it did not take long, it took around about a month for us to establish that the disease was in this entire area, this four mile area in Grand Cayman, but we decided to go further and and survey the entire three islands or almost the entire three islands. The areas in the yellow are the areas that we didn't get to, but we did have a lot of dive companies that helped us to check these areas and to see if they've seen any big white lesions in that area. So after doing that, we were quite confident to say the only area that had stony coral tissue loss disease was at this area on the north of, of Grand Cayman which is what I was talking about earlier with this linear progression. Once it arrives and establishes itself, it spreads um, in the direction, on any direction on the reef. So here is our map from October 2021. Um, we should have our November map by the end of this week. We weren't able to get it for today, unfortunately. And you can see where the epicenter was and the way that it spread it around our island um, in the last, in the last um, year and a half. So it's, it's almost engulfed our entire island. Um, and we have done many, we realized pretty early on that we were not able to stop the disease, but we are able to mitigate the impacts. So there is some good news there. Um, we recently surveyed the sister islands in October and September, no, August and September this year, 
and we, we didn't find any stony coral tissue loss disease there. There was some suspects, but we sent our team over there to check and it ended up just being quite plague disease. It didn't progress on the reef like it has done here. So that's, that's some good news. Um, yeah, so it's only an area on the south side that's still free of the disease. And there's an area on the west side, but it's, we believe that by the end of the year, it's likely that the entire island will have, have stony coral tissue loss disease on the reefs. One of the next things that we did was we tagged corals across two sites, the sites um, Penny's Arch and Max's Garden. Max's Garden is about a mile and a half away from Penny's Arch. So um, Penny's Arch was our way that we can track corals for the first time to find out if we're seeing similar results to other countries that have been doing monitoring to see if it's spreading at the same speed, if it's infecting the same species. And our tagging site on Max's garden was to follow the disease through time to see exactly what species were infected and when. So there wasn't any disease at Max's garden at the time that the corals were tagged. So it's a control site um, for our studies. So we were able to say that once a coral is infected, the colony dies within weeks to months, which is similar to what's been seen in the rest of the region. And the stony coral tissue loss disease progression rates vary depending on species and size. So this is a Copophilia natans, um, a boulder brain coral, and it took four months to die. Um, whereas the previous Dicocenia stokesii, the elliptical star coral that I showed in a previous slide, only took two weeks to die. So that's the difference between the size and also the species ability to try and withstand um, completely being overcome by the disease. But it's been very rare that we've found corals that um, have some remaining tissue left over. Uh, there has been a couple of instances with, uh, with the great star coral where you, we found single polyps left from a disease colony that have stayed alive, but only time will tell whether they are able to stay alive for, for the future. But having, having this ability to track through time is great evidence where we make our judgments on um, what to treat and where to treat and which corals can be saved and, and things like that. Here are some results from our, from our study at Max's Garden on the control site. Um, we tagged approximately eight of these species and we track them through time, weekly intervals. And out of the colonies that we tagged for the smooth flower coral, we experienced 100% death. We experienced 100% death of the maize coral. We experienced 75% death of the elliptical star coral, which is interesting because it's also a highly susceptible species. Boulder brain corals were 100%. The great star corals were 100%. Symmetrical brain corals were 100%. Um, the results weren't very uplifting, that's to say. But, um, so yeah, this is also our results of February, 2021. We still have to go back out there and take more pictures of the tag corals to see if, you know, see if the rest of the elliptical star corals died. And the same with these ones too, the lettuce coral, boulder star coral, groove brain coral, massive starlet coral. We didn't see 100% death of these species um, at that time. Um, so we'll be going out soon to find out how they fared for the last, the last six months. So our response to stony coral tissue loss disease. This is a very dynamic project. <laughs> it changes a lot. Um, and we adapt with the region on the best practices and the best evidence that's been found on how to mitigate the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease within the region. One of the main goals of our project um, is to contribute to the epidemiological research. Um, so that's looking into what the pathogen is and, and how it affects the corals at a microscopic level. So we've been taking hundreds of samples of corals and sending them to specialists in the US who look at these tissues and try and piece together information about 
the disease that's not known because it's such a new disease. Um, so that's ongoing. We should actually be finished a, a large part of this project in, at the end of this month, which we're excited about. But there's always other known areas to try and um, to try and find new treatments. Um, there's always people looking for samples so that they can try and test these samples with different treatments to see if they can find a cure, like a complete cure for the disease. The correspondence is very important. We have collaborators in the UK and in the US and all around the region who are all working together to try and find um, answers to the outstanding questions about this disease. Um, because we were one of the later countries to get infected, we were able to work on top of the knowledge that had already been discovered within the region about this disease um, and then contribute in a way that was useful to expand the research. So it's been really, it's been really innovative and, and great to collaborate with such a large community who are all trying to fight for the same thing to preserve our coral reefs. We have strike teams. Um, we have one strike team at the Department of Environment in Grand Cayman. We have trained individuals in the sister islands if the disease is ever to get there. We also have a strike team with Ocean Frontiers on the East End. And this may expand, expand in the future because it only um, increases the amount of individuals that can help with the treatments. It's just a lot of training that has to go in beforehand before we can get to that point. So the strike team is what I want to focus on for the rest of this presentation. Data management, uh, every, everything that we do in the field has to be documented and written up at the end of the day. So an enormous amount of the time um, of this project goes into looking at the results from all of our field work to see um, what is going on in the reefs, whether our treatments are effective, um, if the disease is changing in any way, keeping up to date with the rest of the region's work. Um, we're all working together to try and have the best response possible and the most effective and the most efficient response possible. So going into more detail um, about our strike teams, we have DOE training, surveillance and reporting, coral treatments, monitoring and disinfecting. So I'll go through each of those briefly now. So DOE training, we are in the middle of session one. This is session one that we tend to give to all interested parties who uh, would like to become a volunteer with the Department of Environment or who would just like some more knowledge about the, the disease. Session two is on coral disease identification. So touching more on how that slide that I was looking at with all the different types of disease, really going into details about the differences and how you can identify it underwater. Because when you start off in this field, you go in and everything looks the same. And then you start to tease apart uh, the differences between them. The third session is on treatment options. So. This is about our treatments that we're doing to help mitigate the disease, um, how we make the treatment. It's quite a procedure uh, and how it's applied in the field. So that's what you would learn in session three. And session four is on coral identification, which is really important to, um, in order to put the treatment in the right places, you need to know a little bit about your corals and who's who and why in the future, we might be treating some types, uh, some species, and treating other types with another um, with another treatment. It's ever expanding as new research becomes as developed. Each of these sessions, we try to follow up by in water training sessions. It's one thing to see to see in a presentation how to apply the disease the disease treatments, but then doing it in the field is a little bit different. So we have practical sessions that follow follow the the um these online training sessions so boat tours this is how we find out where the disease was on our island uh, back on in june 2020 and in august this year uh, we try to spot from the surface where the disease is so i'm not sure if you can see this one uh, but if you squint your eyes a little bit, and this is taken on a GoPro, so if you if you were actually in the field, it might be easier to see. It's actually right in the middle of the picture. 
So this is about from 40 foot, 10 meters. So we, that's, the, that's the depth that we normally tow above. If you have a free dive down to the reef, you can get closer and it starts to become more apparent. And then um, it's really easy to see that it is a disease and that there's no living tissue on that white area there. Um, so sometimes we would take pictures, the easier it gets to identify it and the less pictures you have to take because you can just say whether it's in an area or not. Um, but if you do see a um, disease like this in any of the areas that it doesn't say on the map that skittle D is there, then we welcome you to, to send your photos to the department. We have uh, EpiCollect 5 app um, for citizen scientists that would like to report about the disease. Uh, we do have over 50 entries now for the app. Um, it was quite difficult, I've been told in the beginning, or quite time consuming, I shouldn't say difficult, but we've made it super simple. So if you wanted to download that and give it a try, we would welcome any feedback on the app itself. Typically, if anyone sends me pictures by emails or by, by WhatsApp, then I'll upload these photos to the app so that I have everything in the one place. And then we can look back and say, oh, this person found this disease at Don Foster's on, on um, June 2021, but we thought it didn't arrive there until August 2021. So we can decipher um, whether there's any differences and whether the disease picture that was submitted was actually stony coral tissues, the tissueless disease and things like that. So you can search for EpiCollect 5 um, on your Android or your iPhone. And um, once you've downloaded it, search for SCTLD report Caribbean and it should pop up. Um, and if you need any more information on it, we can send you that by email. But the typical information that we do need from you, if you do want to make an observation um, and send it in to us, is photos are incredibly useful, the date that it was taken, uh, time of observation, what dive site was it at, was it a dive site or was it um, at a random location, um, do you have coordinates if it was from a random location, the approximate depth of your observation, uh, species affected if you know that, um, we would be able to tell that from your photo too. Um, number of species infected. Uh, if you think it's stony crawl tissue loss disease or something else, where we'd like to know where all of these kinds of diseases are located around the islands um, and any other notes. So if, if we were to receive a submission on EpiCollect or from email about a new area that we weren't aware of, then we would then we would then head out and check to make sure that it was the disease. Um, so if someone was to send me a picture from Little Cayman, which people have in the past, we would look at the picture. If it looked anything like stony coral tissue disease, we would fly over there and check it, or we would get our conservation officer in Little Cayman to go out and take photos of the coral because it's very important. We know as soon as possible if it's in a new location. So previous treatments that we've been using um, back at the beginning of the year, uh, we used coral removal and a coral fire break strategy. We removed, um, we removed over a thousand corals from the area to try and limit the pathogen loading, to try and slow down the pre disease progression, which was going at a rate of a mile a month. Um, it did seem to slow it down, that along with the fire break. The fire break strategy was that we removed three highly susceptible species um, that are the first corals to get infected in an area from a 300 meter area. Um, and then to see whether that would slow down the spread and the rate of spread of the disease. And at that time, we hoped that it would stop it completely if a big enough area didn't have these corals that seem to light a fire on the rest of the species on the reef. So um, unfortunately, it didn't stop the disease progression, and, um, but it did slow the progression rate down considerably, which was really interesting. 
although to say for sure that it was because of our efforts takes a lot more consideration um, time of year um, the type of topography the area all interferes with the ability for us to say yes we, we we slowed it down there's there's other factors in play that need to be taken into consideration too um, but we after doing similar treatments where we're treating a large amount of corals in an area it also seems to have slowed down the progression from a mile a month to sometimes less than 0 0.2 miles per month which is really great to see our current coral treatments, uh, the most effective treatment option available is amoxicillin plus base 2B. Base 2B is a specialized paste that's designed by Ocean Alchemists um, who, who deliver this product to us, where we then um, mix it together with the antibiotic amoxicillin so that we have a way that we can apply amoxicillin directly to the disease lesion of a coral. So that is done one by one. It takes a long time, which is why we have a, a team um, established at the Department of Environment under strike teams in the East End of Grand Cayman to go out and do this five times a week. Uh, so it's, it's, we've increased the load that we've been, we've been treating. So from May, you can see that we had under a thousand treatments um, for the month, but then our most latest one was above 3,000 corals that we treated in one month. So it's been great to see the difference as our team becomes more effective at the treatments, really how, how much we can get out there and how many corals we can try to save. Um, and the total has been just under 14,000, which is, which is pretty incredible. The success, um, it's, it has been successful at treating lesions um, on several species, which you can see here. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, typically, this looks a bit like other diseases. <laughs> it looks a bit like um, maybe what white plague disease would look like, because white plague um, sometimes shows a white band and then it stops for a little while and then uh, later, it'll show another white band as it progresses um, slowly over time. Um, but this is this corals; these corals are considered healthy because they've been treated and not shown further signs of the disease um, on that lesion. Um, however, the reinfection of the healthy-looking tissue is possible. So when you apply the treatment directly to the lesion, it halts the lesion but it doesn't treat the rest of the colony. So it just treats the lesion, which means if however the disease is passing in the reef, if it's a little bit of tissue that's sloughed off from a coral um, further down the reef and it lands on the tissue of a, of a seemingly healthy area of a treated colony, the disease can still become infected, unfortunately. Not always the case, but we're running experiments to see to see which species um, become reinfected more and which ones do not. We have other hopeful treatments on the horizon, such as probiotics, just like you would drink a yogurt to stimulate your good gut bacteria. Um, scientists from the Smithsonian Institute have actually isolated uh, healthy bacteria from corals and areas where Skittle D has been present for a long time, but some certain corals have survived. Um, they isolate good bacteria from these corals and then they go down to a coral that's infected with stony coral tissueless disease. They tie a bag over it with weighted chain mail at the bottom and they inject these healthy bacteria into the bag and it's thought to slow down the progression of stony coral tissueless disease, which is a great technique. These bacteria are already present on the reef, um, so we're not adding anything um, that's not native into the environment. Uh, and it's, we're gonna start collecting uh, healthy samples from our region soon so that we can contribute to this area of the project. 
still, as I'm sure you can picture, it's still a very time consuming aspect of the project. You have to go down there with bags, leave the bags on for two hours while the treatment works, go down and recover the bag. Um, it's still not a cure. It's just helping to mitigate the effects by saving these large colonies that can re reproduce for the future. And there's, there's some other um, treatments by, uh, by the similar company, Ocean Alchemist. Um, who are, have a new product that we're waiting to hear results about. And this is also um, made of natural products and has had some success, but we're waiting to have the final verdict of whether it's better to use this treatment rather than using the amoxicillin. Um, but amoxicillin is still the, the best so far. Live gear decontamination the last thing I want to touch on um, because if we dive in an infected location and then dive in an uninfected location we could be uh, spreading the disease we ask that all divers in the Cayman Islands disinfect their gear after every dive we also can say to consider um, we also say to consider renting locally like local dive gear especially if you're traveling to the sister islands consider uh, renting local dive gear there um, if you do go to the sister islands, you will have to disinfect your gear um, before you dive in that area. Uh, we also say to disinfect before, like before you go to healthy sites after every single dive too. Um, and also to disinfect your bilge water when you're moving from a, a disease infected location to a, a seemingly healthy location. It's also about reducing the pathogen loading. So even though we are experiencing a lot of our reefs that are affected with the disease, that are affected with the disease, some have less um, species infected than others. So the progression on the reef itself takes some time. So if we're if we're um, diving from a, a heavily infected site to a a less infective site, we could be helping the disease to progress faster. Same with um, having good buoyancy when you're on an infected reef. We really want to promote that your feet should be up in the air and not touching the reef, um, especially if you join our team. That's something that you'll hear a lot is um, trying not to kick the reef. As divers, we, we try to do that anyway. Sometimes it can't be helped, um, but to have the best posture in the water because if you if you touch a diseased coral and then touch another coral that doesn't have the disease, it's helping along that progression by direct touch. These are the protocols for dive gear disinfectant and um, bilge water disinfectant and disposal. I will send these around separately to everyone. And if you have any questions about them, we can go through them. But typically you soak your gear for 10 minutes in an ammonium-based uh, solution for your dive gear and your snorkel gear. And then you have to make sure that you put some of the disinfectant inside your BCD too, uh, because I'm sure some people have had it when you have to empty out your BCD before you get onto a flight because there's some water in it and it's extra heavy. That gear could be infected um, water that could be taken to a new location. So it's important to put some solution into your BCDs. It's then very important to uh, soak for 10 minutes, for a minimum of 10 minutes, and then soak your gear afterwards in fresh water or thoroughly hose it down as well as inside of your BCD bladder. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but it's one way that we can help avoid the human spread of the disease and which could limit the speed of progression. Uh, for your boat villages, we say to use a 1% bleach solution, um, again, to soak it for, for uh, 10 minutes and then to pump it out either on land. We remove our boats from the water every day, so we disinfect our village every single day when we get back or in the morning. Um, if you're in the water, you have to go um, at least a mile offshore to 
to um, or half a mile offshore, I think we said, to to release the the bleach water um, into the environment away from the reef system. Um, and then for for disposing of your for your disinfectant, this is more for for dive companies who have these disinfectant bins in their areas. They can um, they have to make sure that the disinfectant doesn't run into the ocean because ammonium based disinfectant um, is toxic to to wildlife. So most of the bins are on wheels and can be transported to to the ground where it can evaporate and, and break down in comparison to being put into the ocean. It also shouldn't go down any drains and it shouldn't go into any septic tanks. The, the ammonium-based disinfectant can kill the, the good bacteria in septic tanks, so it's important that it doesn't go into any drainage areas at all. It goes directly onto, onto the ground where it can break down. So how can you help us? Uh, you can help us to promote um, controls to disinfect dive gear and snorkel gear and boat villages for local visitors between the islands, um, promote public outreach literature on disease and mitigate and control efforts. Um, it's, it's, and it's just sharing information and helping to educate people. Uh, word of mouth is very powerful in these islands. So we appreciate if you can reach out to friends and if you see someone disinfecting their dive gear not in a not in a correct way if they're not soaking it for 10 minutes if they're not putting it into their bcd to help communicate these important messages and then if you're an experienced diver which i believe everyone on this call is you can you can join our response efforts at the doe um, when we when we can have volunteers out in the field with us so thank you for listening and um, for more information, you can get in contact with me. Uh, my details are on the screen there and we can have a little discussion now um, if you have any questions. I think I could see some in the chats.